Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, this is uh, Marlon Barresolano. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? And uh, well, this is our first uh, session, uh, this collaborative uh, session of a discussion, and that's kind of the idea of create this dialogical space for uh, Meta Academy. Uh, Meta Academy at Bates uh, 2013, that we have the opportunity to have developed this lab on the work uh, and ideas of Nancy Stark Smith. And uh, practically one of the layers of this uh, project is to have the opportunity to explore the space of the internet to, for this kind of gathering. Uh, we're using this platform, platform because we want to practically uh, have uh, more uh, discussion and uh, we are also trying to uh, bring uh, and problematize perhaps some uh, aspects of uh, embodiment and or some uh, approaches of uh, the understanding of presence. Uh, part of the this project has been uh, made possible for, uh, for uh, some help with with the help of some grants from Iseka Amsterdam, uh, from uh, also uh, the support uh, of certain my position as a researcher assist, associate at the HZT in Berlin, and uh, also uh, with the collaboration, of course, of the speakers and of Nancy Stark Smith, uh, that has allowed us to uh, work and uh, as, and also very generously has been working together with us. So uh, we have uh, in this uh, first pilot, because that's very also very important to point out that this is the first pilot of a project that was started to be conceived uh, next, uh, last year. And uh, you know, uh, it's, it's the first pilot and we are trying to kind of uh, explore <laughs> this, uh, this space. And uh, so we are trying to kind of uh, develop also uh, this project in this kind of like parallel axis. One is about the content of, of the things that we are, uh, oh, Corinne kind of uh, fell off. It's like trying to develop the, okay, she's back. <laughs> and uh, yes, trying to develop uh, certain ideas about the content and also some ideas in relationship with uh, digital literacy. So I think that that's a, a kind of a very kind of broad introduction, but this is, uh, you know, we are honored to have uh, distinguished uh, collaborators and, and speakers. And uh, so I think that, uh, you know, part of the, the format that we will have and is, is we will have uh, each of the speakers, we have an introduction, the guest speaker, we have an introduction about their own research and then of course part of the you know we, we are very uh, pleased to have Nancy here with us to actually uh, respond or, or actually create provocations or uh, do provocations from the provocations and uh, and see how can we uh, have a, a dialogue. Uh, it's important to say also that the we use as a kind of portal for the discussion the a material uh, of that is in one of the in the one of the dance tech interviews that is uh, called an emergent on the score and uh, we uh, suggested to the speaker to talk uh, to watch the this interview and then uh, just to have certain kind of uh, reactions or comments kind of uses as a, as hyperlinks to uh, any kind of ideas or, or prompt uh, uh, some uh, topics for this conversation um, so, well, uh, that's it. Uh, I think that I, what I will do now is, uh, I hope, hopefully we will have some people popping in. Uh, I don't know what's going on. But one of the things is that we will try to uh, speak first, you know, like after this we go to certain introduction. But, you know, kind of uh, create a presentation of from 10 to 15 minutes, uh, mostly uh, Kareen, after that Bill. And then uh, we will have uh, the opp opportunity to discuss uh, uh, with more detail. Okay. So, well, I switch now to Rachel, uh, that she's in this space here. 
uh, in the space that we are at base. Hello, Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Boja, and I'm I'm sharing the room right now with uh, William Seeley and Nancy Stark Smith. And um, <laughs> people only call me that when I'm in trouble. <laughs> w. P. Seeley, William Bill Seeley, and Nancy Stark Smith. I'm a dance professor at Bates College and a collaborator on this first pilot program, and I'm very excited to be uh, working with you all. I'm going to um, very briefly just introduce, show you um, Bill and Nancy. Um, Nancy Stark Smith, who is a, a improviser, educator, writer, and editor of Contact Quarterly magazine, and a very influential teacher um, and instigator of the form Contact Improvisation. Thank you, Nancy, for joining us. And um, Bill Seeley, who is an artist, philosopher, with an interest in uh, neuroscience and cognition. Um, and our presentations will be going in the order of Corrine Jola, who um, Marlon will introduce briefly, then Bill, and then Nancy's responses. So, Marlon. Uh, yes, well, thank you. I'm back here. <laughs> yes, so, uh, well, we have uh, in France, we have from Paris, we have uh, Corinne Jola, who's a uh, uh, who studied psychology and dance, uh, practically in parallel, and uh, she's a researcher uh, in dance and neuroscience and NSERMCA, and she's still in uh, Paris. And uh, so I think that I will pass directly to Corinne, just to you know uh, take it away, introducing yourself, and start this discussion. Okay, hello everyone. So I'm now hopefully there in space continuously before I lost you already once. I don't know if you noticed. Um, so I'm here in Paris. It's really hot at the moment, <laughs> but it's still better than uh, the rain we had before. Um, I'm studying here in Paris at the moment how the brain processes the composition when you watch dance. Uh, and this is from the framework of language. Uh, this is a project I started uh, a bit less than a year ago. And before that, amongst other research I've done, uh, was in Glasgow on a watching dance project, where we studied audiences, kinesthetic responses to watching dance. And so, over the last 10 years, I have really tried to combine dance and cognitive science or cognitive neuroscience. And I say try. Because when you see, when I go through some slides, there are three slides of some of my dance performance I created, and about four slides of some scientific research I have published, or that is published by others. And what I would actually have preferred to not have this clear distinction between the practice-based uh, research or the performance I've done and the scientific research, because one of my main aims is really to make dance performances that can at the same time be choreographic practices as well as scientific investigations. And that can be either on the audience or the dancers or in the most preferable situation, the interaction between the audience and the dancers. And that, that's one of my main aims uh, that I had over the last uh, few years. And I'm getting closer, but it's a process. And the other aim is really to continue to use dance uh, and the knowledge, the embodied knowledge that is in dance, in dancers, in dance practitioners, but also in the whole culture and history of dance, to advance uh, empirical research and our understanding of the human brain. Because uh, I think there's a lot of potential in dance if it's used properly in scientific research. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, just a few slides. Um, and after the interview that I listened uh, with Nancy and you, Marlon, um, I thought it was really nice how it seems that this um, interdisciplinary research that is more and more happening kind of advances dance practitioners to think about the methods they're using to, to create the body and mind to prepare it for the creative process. In my practice, I'm much less clear um, which methods I'm using, and I have the impression that I'm just for each individual performance, I was trying to find a different way of how I can 
relate the performative work with science. And I just want to say them briefly to kind of show you uh, where I am at the moment. So this first image is of uh, one of my earlier dance performances, Brainstorm, where I transcribed movements that I imagined verbally on tape, then it was still, and the dancers listened to them and translated into movements individually, so they did not know who was the other dancer until the moment of the performance on stage. And the idea was that the audience, by comparing how the two dancers interpreted the movements, that they can much better access what I actually had in mind. And I could just work with different ways of prescribing movement and creating dynamic. And the next slide is an image of uh, another performance, uh, actually a performance installation which was kind of triggered by the idea of what's happening in the audience's, in the spectator's mind when they watch dance. And somehow we do a lot of research on uh, facial expressions, emotional expressions. So with the idea of a movement analysis, we felt like also the movements or the facial expressions of the audience should be a window into what's happening in the brain. And this was just a playful way of filming facial responses to uh, different audience members when they watch the same piece of dance. Then the next slide is the last image of a performance I wanted to show. It's the most recent one. And here I, I didn't worry too much about uh, being scientifically accurate or anything. Um, and I just used the terminology that uh, scientists use into the research of the smallest and largest particle and created movement improvisations with these terms and was kind of playing with the idea that maybe if we are really kind of accurate with these movement terms, uh, we can create a kinesthetic atmosphere of these universal rules. Uh, so for me that was the most playful way of, of relationship between science and performance. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm kind of seemingly just explore different ideas. While in the scientific research, which we then can go to the next slide. So this is the big jump. Um, here it's much more clear what is the method that we are using, although don't forces me to a certain degree to question some of the methods that otherwise I would be using. But here it's much more clear. And the research in neuroscience uh, by means of dance using dance to study the human brain activity and function goes mostly back, most of them goes back to the neuron network. So an Italian research team found by coincidence that the human monkey has certain activity in brain areas that are also activated, that are equally activated during passive observation of an action, like when an experimenter grasps something and the monkey watches, and the same neurons also fired when the monkey actually grasped um, the, the, the food, for example, himself, so as if internally mirroring the action. And then you can see on the top left the brain with a few dots highlighted which are some of the areas that we would expect also in humans if there was such a network like IFT, inferior frontal gyrus, IPL, interior parietal lobe. These are the two kind of main neuron areas. But then also some other areas which are known to be activated when you see bodies or when you see faces. At the bottom of that uh, simplified brain model, you see the activity of dancers when they have physically embodied the movements they watch. So when ballet dancers watch ballet movements or when capoeira dancers watch capoeira movements, these are the areas in red that are enhanced in activity for familiar, physically familiar movements. It's a study by Carl Marino and it's a seminal study um, that used the uh, dance to study the neuron network. And you can see there are similar areas they found. Uh, Primotor, which is important for action execution and close to IFG and the IPS, which is in the area of the IPL. So all what I actually was expected. But when you think of, you watch somebody else, and, and this is kind of what I would like to discuss also with Nancy maybe later, 
where she said, oh, I, I don't know really what the others feel or what the others do, but the idea about all the mirror neurons is really that because we can mirror others' actions, we kind of feel what they would feel as one of the ideas, to be able to understand it. But the, the sensory areas, the somatosensory areas, are often not activated in the studies uh, where they use dance. And that's on the right side, where uh, Kaisers and Katsula compared individually for subjects ex executing an action, but this was just a gesture, not a dance movement, and passive observing an action, and the areas that were activated for both of these tasks were amongst others the somatosensory cortex. And this is really kind of for the sensation of the movement when you're doing it, or as if it would feel when you're doing it. And the question really is, why, why has this not been shown in, in all of the studies? And then you can go to the next slide. So we felt that if you really need to have the physical knowledge, the embodied knowledge to, to enjoy and to sense the dancers' movements, why are so many people go and watch dance who have not dance experience? And actually this is very different for different cities. In some cities you only see dancers in the audience, in others you also see a lot of non -dancers. Uh, especially for ballet, classical ballet dance, there are a lot of elderly people who have never trained in ballet but really enjoy it. So we had, you can see here on the left, two people um, in the control condition, that's why they have the eyes closed. But otherwise they watch a live performance of uh, six minutes ballet, six minutes Indian dance or six minutes acting control condition. And on the right side you can see the dancers in full costumes. And for us this was really important because these were people who have never trained the movements but who go and watch dance a lot. So they have no so-called embodied experience of those classical movements but they have a visual experience of those movements. And we hold a coil, a magnetic coil, over the motor cortex. Yes? No? I thought somebody was interrupting. Um, to to see to to, tri to stimulate uh, externally the motor cortex uh, to induce an action potential so as if you would move your hand yourself you do it from externally so below you can see this curve uh, first if I'm pointing to it you won't notice but kind of the first line is the artifact from the stimulation and then you see a red amplitude which is much bigger than the blue and we know and this is the measurement from an MEG from the muscles or the sub threshold activity and we know from many many studies that if you think of movement if you prepare a movement if you watch movement this potential is enhanced with the same amount of stimulation than if you're doing something which is unrelated to movement as much as possible. So we did this with visual experts and with non-experts and what we found on the right side, you can see in black the bar on the left is the response of the, uh, the, 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 the size of the amplitude compared to the control condition when ex visually experienced ballet dancers watch ballet movements and the black on the right is much smaller and that is when they watch Indian movements, something they have no visual experience in. And this is from the arm muscle, which is uh, moved a lot in, in ballet dance. So what we can say is that visual experienced ballet dancers who have no physical training in these movements show enhanced motor simulation to the movements of ballet. Uh, compared to Indian dance or acting. So it's not really just the physical expertise that is important to, to go along with the dance and to engage in the dance, but also visual experience can, can support this. You can go to the next slide, the second last slide. We did the same study, um, again with another group of participants, just novices, and compared when the, the data we had from the novices watching the dance live, which was close to the visual experience of the visual experts, but probably didn't mean anything to the novices we didn't know, and then compared this with the responses of another group of novices who watched the same movements on the computer screen in the lab. And this you can see on the left image uh, sketch. So this is really the normal situation of a lab experiment and not the one you see on the right with a live performance. And we can discuss pros and cons of, of using live performances later. 
And what we find, um, so without me pointing to it, uh, I'm not sure you can see it well. On the left, in the middle, you have a higher amplitude for the novices when they watch Indian dance. In, in black is always live, and in gray is always on video. So when novices who never go and watch dance, neither Indian dance, nor ballet, nor acting, they show much higher uh, cortical activity when they watch ballet dance, uh, pardon, Indian dance, uh, compared to ballet or acting. Marlon, you made a big... Um, <laughs> sorry. Am I, am I over? No, 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 you're okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's just I am dealing with some little issues here. Sorry. <laughs> and so, so this kind of shows when novices watch Indian dance, with, which has a lot of gestural actions in it, even though you might not com understand these actions. But if you watch it live as a novice, you engage much more with it than if you watch it on video. And you engage much more with these gestural actions, whether you understand it or not, than with more formal dance movements in ballet or the miming actions from the acting control condition. That is one important point. So it really matters if you have an experiment showing dance life or showing it on video. Uh, then the other point is on the right, where we see that that was the measurement for the enjoyment ratings. And enjoyment ratings are higher for Indian dance and acting um, for the life, which is the black, compared to the video, which is the gray bar. But also, if you compare, compare all the free bars from the life and all the free bars from the video, you can see there is a difference in the enjoyment ratings for the video, but there is no difference in the enjoyment ratings uh, for the life conditions, meaning the life conditions are enjoyed by the novices equally, but not when they see it on video. And this is a really important point to say, if you do experiments on video with dance, for example, there might be a huge confound of enjoyment between conditions which you don't might not have when you see life. So this was uh, the two most important findings. And then the last slide. So. This kind of goes back to the idea I've started with saying that there's a lot of power in dance um, and a lot of knowledge, embodied knowledge, that I think is really useful to use to better understand the human brain. Uh, but only if you if you use the stimuli dance in, in the right way. In the top line, you see an experiment where they, where they studied everyday actions, and I mean, even there it matters, and they compared um, uh, actually miming, taking a class, and actually really taking a class. And these are the responses of a monkey. And a monkey neurons, mirror neurons, responded stronger when the experiment or the assistant was actually taking the class and not miming the action. But when you look at what the monkey sees on the right, you can see that the action itself is different, not just what happens with the hand, but the whole body gesture is different. So it is possible that the monkey really reads from the whole body gestures, this is real, this is not real, and has a completely different response to it. Then I showed an example of uh, white dots, point light displays, how it is normally used for experiments to reduce as much as possible confounding information. But at the very bottom left, you see an image of what an audience actually sees in the theater, which is much more complex, much more rich, and which is one of the reasons why audience go and watch dance. They don't want to see a performance that lasts three seconds. You want to see a performance that lasts an hour or two, depending on how much you paid for the ticket as well, or whether you like it or not. So the stimuli are really important. And this is also the last study I wanted to emphasize, where we compared kinesthetic responses of uh, participants watching these photographs from a dance photographer that are either different in, in the direction in the horizontal or in the vertical, and this can be even chomps. So it was a uh, subject group of dance students who made these errors, and this was just to select the, the right stimuli for, for the conditions. And in fact is that if the movement is in the vertical, it Subjects respond much stronger, saying, I have a kinesthetic experience looking at this picture, than when the movement is horizontal. 
So meaning that whenever you use DON stimuli to study mirror neuron network, it might be that actually the direction of the movement is hugely important and um, uh, modifying the, the data you get, whether you find more or less activity in uh, sensory motor or motor remotor areas. And yes, this is it. <laughs> so, um, Bill, do you want to just move right into your presentation or take a minute to respond to what Kareen put out um, there? I, I, much, uh, a lot of what I write about and what I think about was written by Corinne Jola, so I, I think that... Um, <laughs> so, so maybe there'll be some, some overlap. Probably what I'll do is uh, try not to repeat anything that Corinne said, but just go through the slides that would have set up to what she talked about, or something like that. I, I'm going to talk about three different things, so this will be part of it. I'm Bill Seeley. I'm a professor of philosophy here at Bates. Uh, I was once upon a time a sculptor, and I was very curious about how artworks worked, and so I went back to school and changed uh, my life to become a philosopher of art. And what's nice is that neuroscientists like Corinne have given us a lot of data to help us understand some things that we used to maybe speculate about a little bit, or at least data to help us sort out theories that we didn't have a way to sort out before. That's the, so how about a slide? So there's some nice pictures of Nancy dancing on that slide. <laughs> We can skip that slide. That's just the archive slide. So uh, I wanted to talk about three things, and I'll try to talk as fast as I can. Uh, one is embodied cognition uh, and the idea of embodiment, and um, uh, some thoughts that I had that uh, there was some resonance between the idea of embodied cognition and the things that Nancy was saying um, in the interview uh, with Marlon that I think we all took a look at. And then I'll talk a little bit about neuroscience and dance, where neuroscience is used to study aspects of dance, and then a little bit about what in philosophy we might call neuroscience of dance, or a little bit about what we might learn about what dance is uniquely as an art form from the stuff that we get from neuroscience and dance. So next slide. I think in the next slide, all right, the next slide uh, says, uh, within philosophy and cognitive science more broadly, there's a, a current movement uh, for embodied cognition, embedded cognition, sometimes called situated cognition. Uh, and the thought is that the, there's an old-fashioned computational way we have of thinking about thinking um, and acting, which is, it feels very comfortable. It feels sort of like the way we are consciously aware of ourselves acting. Uh, it's the thought that our sort of behavior follows a perceive, plan, act cycle. So that we perceive the world, and in perceiving we collect information, we build sort of a picture of the world, a model of the world, we interpret that model, uh, and maybe apply some schema or some plan. We say, oh, this is a peanut butter sandwich situation, I better do X, Y, and Z, and then we act. So that there are three discrete stages. There's the perceiving stage, the planning and thinking stage, um, and then the acting stage. And this, of course, feels very comfortable when we think about the way we go about our day, or at least the way we're aware of going about our day. But if you think a little bit about it, this is pretty slow uh, and pretty brittle. Uh, so you'd have to actually have a plan in place for every novel situation in order to flexibly interact with the world. And so the embodied uh, picture says, look, it probably isn't going to go like this. Just think about opening a door or think about trying to move your foot as you walk down the street. You can't, it doesn't really seem like we perceive, stop, think about it, plan, and then move our body. Rather, it seems like we have uh, sensor motor routines that are for what we might call dynamic embodied interactions with the world. It isn't so much that we stop and think about how to uh, go about what to do next. It's that as we move through the world, we adjust our body uh, on the fly relative to the way sensory information is uh, moving around us. And so one way to think of it uh, is sort of like this. Uh, the perceived plan act model makes it seem like you have this mind, and it's this mind made of sentences and thoughts that are disembodied, uh, and that we sort of impose it on our body to move it around. But that doesn't seem a likely way that our mind would have evolved. It's not like we uh, evolved a mind and then went in search of a body and some actions to put it on. Rather, it, it seems that our mind evolved in lockstep with our body, and maybe we needed a body first so that we would 
think that our mind was much more in tune, much more uh, integrated with our body in a way that would enable us to do things uh, like the things we don't remember doing in a day-to-day -day, uh, context, like opening doors and moving our feet, what we call smooth coping with the environment. So another slide. So in philosophy, for years and years, people have said the really hard problem is understanding what consciousness is, what our explicit understanding of the world is. But in embodied cognition, uh, we think maybe that's not right. Maybe the really hard problem was what Rodney Brooks calls insect intelligence. Maybe the really hard problem was something a little bit different. So if you think uh, sort of, of the evolution of life and the evolution of intelligence on the planet, it, right, for, for a really, really long time, we had single cell organisms and really tiny organisms. And it took a really long time to evolve into sort of these complex organisms that could wander around and leave the water and sort of move. So the, the idea was that insect intelligence took a really long time to evolve and that cognition took a, is sort of an add-on towards the end. Right? So the thought goes something like this. If I want to evolve a mind, I need to be able to move around in the environment first because I need to move around and bump into the environment for the environment to push back for me to know what I need to adapt to, for me to know how I need to flexibly evolve, right? So what we really want, right, before we evolve intelligence is a stable platform for exploring. And this stable platform for exploring can't involve intelligence first because we'd have to know what we were interacting with in order to get started, right? And so the thought is that the first thing we need in order to evolve intelligence is a set of sensor and motor routines that, avoid a, that enable us essentially to avoid things. We need a sensor motor routine to wander, and that wandering routine needs to enable us to avoid objects, and it needs to enable us to engage with the world. And so the thought is that mind is not this disembodied Cartesian thing for doing geometry in an abstract space, but it's rather emergent in our sensor motor embodied interactions with the world, which I think has some resonance with some things that Nancy was saying, right? So the things we get from consciousness, from explicit thinking, from perceive, plan, act, right? Uh, these are learning procedures that enable us to reflect and think, and they sort of give flexibility to these otherwise sort of stable routines for smooth coping. And so, right, that's where we get an exclamation point. We say, an emergent underscore. So, I mean, I thought that, you know, that, that was Marlon's term. Well, good. So, so Marlon's interpretation. Yes. Uh, so I, I think the idea of uh, running the right through the procedures of contact improvisational dance for all these years and then discovering this emergent underscore that was the stable platform upon which this reflection and learning and research could go is actually, there's a lot of resonance between this and embodied cognition and it's actually a nice metaphor for understanding the intuitions of embodied cognition. So, so that, that's the stop. We'll just say a full stop there. So, um, the, the nice thing, I think, about the neuroscience of dance stuff in embodied cognition is it reflects a, another idea. So if you have this sort of perceive, plan, act view of cognition, if you think that you're just collecting information abstractly and you're figuring out how to apply it in the world, it gets a little complicated to know how you're going to apply what. What are you going to learn? How are you going to compare things? Right? Uh, but it turns out that your body only moves in a certain number of ways. Your arms are only articulatable in a certain number of ways. You know, I, I think it's probably because I've been eating all my life, but if I just flex my, my bicep, it sort of seems to come to my mouth, right? And so if I'm picking things up as a small child and tasting them, I'm developing these sensory motor routines that pair visual information with somatosensory information, with gustatory and olfactory information. And so the sort of basic idea is that at my body is sort of a morphological computer in a way. My body is a filter on the kind of information that I could gain from the world. And so this suggests that the kind of sensorimotor um, processes, sensorimotor procedures that people study in neuroscience of dance are sort of deeply important for understanding ourselves as thinking, engaging, and acting bodies. So we can try this slide again. So the thought is that there's a lot of new research. It's not all in neuroscience of dance. It's really, it comes out of a, a, a sort of now nascent field called neuroaesthetics, which was sort of started by Margaret Livingston and Samir Zeki, who are very well-respected uh, perceptual neuroscientists. Um, and, and the thought uh, goes sort of, I think, something like this. There's a really natural connection 
between neuroscience of perception and the way artists work. This sort of a natural story about how neuroscience and artworks go together, right? So in, in its broadest sense, cognitive science is this field that studies how organisms acquire, represent, manipulate, and use information in the production of behavior. And neuroscience contributes to this and that it helps us uh, model how this happens. And so there's this neat story we could tell about artworks. Artworks are communicative devices, and I don't mean that Nancy sets out to tell us a story when she works, but there's something about expressing yourself, and maybe not ideas, but something is being expressed when you dance, or certainly from the sort of watching dance perspective, we think of it that way, even if from the producing dance story, there might be a different tale to tell. And so we can think of artworks as these abstract stimuli that are in some way intentionally designed to trigger affective, perceptual, and cognitive responses in viewers. Right? And these are the responses that are constitutive of the artwork's meaning or its content or whatever you want to say about it. Right? So I think the next slide comes up. Right? Oh, no, so that looks like exactly the same. So, uh, no, no, go back one, but it wasn't. Right. So the thought is that um, artists develop uh, formal productive strategies through trial and error by measuring the responses on audience members or on themselves, right? So these are behavioral experiments, right? So that the success and failure of artist productive strategies depends upon the success and failure of other people, including the artists themselves, being able to respond correctly to them, right? Uh, so if you think that perception and cognition is mediated by your brain, by, uh, right, sort of, strategies, neural strategies in your brain, you should expect that there would be a very close coupling between the productive strategies of artists and the kinds of neurophysiological systems that govern thinking and perceiving. And so, right, you, you, you should think, right, that the, well, so you should think that that's going to be a story, and I don't think we have time to talk too much about uh, uh, evidence for this. But the trick to all of this is that when artists build their artworks, they don't just build things that we can perceive. They build things that are constrained by the artistic conventions of a time, by the tastes of people, right? And so built into the story about the close coupling between artist productive strategies and uh, the neurophysiology of perception and cognition is going to be right, a story that the formal productive strategies carry information about the meaning of the artwork by virtue of how information is picked up by the brain and the environment. So we'll skip attentional engines because we're on that. Right. Right. And so, right, we get the story. We can come to understand artworks by coming to understand how consumers uh, acquire, represent, manipulate, and use information from the, the stimulus in order to understand what's going on. And so this leads to what, in philosophy of art, we think there might be three critical questions for understanding how Corinne's research like Corinne's can help us from an art critical perspective understand art. And these questions are something like, what are the key productive strategies at being used in an art form? How are these strategies being used to carry information? And not only how are they being used to carry information, but what is it that accounts for the artistic meaning of that information? What is it independent of just perceiving that matters? So sort of very quickly. In dance, I, I think the, the, the story that we might say is that kinetic transfer is the critical story. It's something about understanding movement and something about understanding maybe even the emotional expressivity of movement but certainly something about the expressivity of movement, right? Um, and Kryn already talked a little bit about point light displays. Point light displays are motion capture videos are, are a nice way of sort of demonstrating the power of kinetic transfer, as, as she suggested. So what we do in these uh, biological movement displays is we put points of light on the joints of actors and we erase all the other information other than the joint, and what is left over is just the interaction of the joints with no other visual information, no other information about appearance. And so these point light displays are pure movement displays. There's no other information in them but biological movement information, the kind of information we think might be involved in kinetic transfer. And what's really cool about this, to use that technical term, is that we can, from these biological motion displays, we can read the gender of the actor, we can read their mood, we can read their intentions, their action intentions, but also more abstract intentions. We can uh, read uh, in, a, in a point light display of interpersonal dialogue, the dynamic social relationships, who's the aggressor, who's not the aggressor, what kind of relationships going on there, is it an argument, are people happy, right? 
Um, and in other uh, studies, people have shown that just in um, point light displays of abstract dance, we can read standard basic emotions like anger, fear, grief, joy, love, and disgust. So we, we get this tale, what are the sort of key strategies? What are the features? Well, biological motion cues. So, right? <clears throat> right. And so we can think of uh, how, how do these biological motion cues carry their information? Well, they carry their information by virtue of this fact that we can interact in this way. Uh, but the tale is that we can model the way they do it in terms of research like Corinne's, where we use mirror neurons, motor mimicry, motor simulation. Uh, and we can measure the way these procedures are paired with the kind of visceral motor uh, processes that are involved in our gut reactions to things in the environment, and we can sort of model how all this is how all this is working in a very quick way. Because I know we need to get Nancy a chance to say something. One more slide. So uh, there's a story that I think summarizes some things that Corinne said. She's being very polite and not interrupting me at this point for my simple philosopher's view of things. Um, but so from a philosophical perspective, we want to finish with two sorts of questions. And the question is something about how does this tell, how does this inform us about what dance is as opposed to just movement? Because of course these procedures, these neurophysiological processes are involved in interacting with people in everyday contexts as well. We wouldn't want to say, well we might want to say, I might want to say that eating a sandwich is a dance. Right? But there's going to be some context where it is a dance, some context where it isn't a dance, right? So we get this old problem, and the old problem is that this alone is not enough to distinguish between labs, lab stimuli and dance works. What we need is some understanding of the conventions that divide these two sorts of things apart, and some understanding of how this information is being used to convey these conventions, to help us understand these conventions. Something a little more cognitive than what we might get in this sort of story. So that's the old problem, which I, I think is solvable. And the new problem is uh, something uh, that's specific to the kind of research that uh, uh, Corinne and her colleagues like Beatriz Cavo Moreno do. Uh, a lot of the research, if I understand, began by helping to understand motor expertise effects in perception. And as Corinne noted, there's a problem here because if only ballet dancers are sensitive to these kinds of biological motion cues, it's not going to help us understand how people understand it as art. So the neat thing that I was going to say that we lead into is this idea about visual familiarity. That if through visual familiarity with the form we come to be able to have the same kind of embodied motoric responses responsible for all this kind of stuff, then we have a story that tells us sort of A, how we uh, gain knowledge of these conventions and B, how to sort out the difference between ordinary and dance works. So I don't know how long that took, but that's uh, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait to read those two papers. I have not yet. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this is a time for us to you know, just have a discussion. And Nancy, I'm hoping that you can start that discussion. And we have some people commenting online um, a little bit, not, not too much. But um, yeah. Are we integrating these comments or? Yeah. Um, no, not right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow, I mean, I just want to take a moment here <laughs> to uh, get back to the body for a second. It's so interesting. I mean, just listening to the two of you is a kind of activity that is so stimulating. And um, you kind of play with language and ideas in the way that feels familiar to me in terms of being in a more abstract environment, a studio, and relating with people and sounds and timing, and um, that you get so excited and wrapped up that there are ideas behind the language and they have relationship to each other. And so in terms of this embodied notion, like where is the body when you're speaking? And where's my body when I'm listening? Of course, it's here and, and auditory, et cetera. But, um, but I'm going to stop that train of thought for a moment arbitrarily just to also say thank you to Marlon and Rachel for this extraordinary experiment. Great. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. All the work that goes into that and taking a taking a risk and bringing us together and um, also feel honored to have been 
brought into the project and also a little shy about it, to be honest. This underscore has been a, a personal practice, a personal research that I share with people who intentionally come to work with me. Um, so to have it to be the subject of inquiry for people who are in a completely different field of study is, is very exciting, actually, and I'm honored to have your reflections on it. Um, and daunting, too. It's almost like a, how do we have our languages meet each other? It's like a foreign country, in a way. And yet it's not. We're human, and we're thinking intelligent beings, and all of the things you were talking about, many of them really resonate on a core level with what I feel like I'm doing and we're doing in the room. Um, and it's exciting to think that certain ideas and research on a scientific level could uh, meet experiential research. We could, I don't know what embodied. I mean, we all have bodies, and the brain is in the body, the embedded and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I sometimes call this play research. When I'm giving the talk about what the underscore is, which, by the way, I've never done publicly the way I did with um, with Marlon, it was in response to the fact that he had been involved in a global underscore through technological interface. And then was going to interview me, I thought, very briefly about what had happened at this global underscore. And then I realized that he actually didn't understand what the underscore was. So I kind of backtracked and brought out the pages and started to do that. And at the end, when it was 45 minutes long, um, I thought, well, he's going to take some snippets and put it together for his own ideas, and that's fine. And he said, no, we want to run the whole thing on the internet. And this, I think, is crucial to this whole project about internet and exchange of information and what's personal, what's private, what's public, what's uh, digital, what's flesh, um, how do we connect, and what's the point of it, and like that. So. Um, that was a side note that really the underscore is shared for me in the context of people that I'm dancing with and exchanging ideas and practice and experience so that we have a lot of practice as a reference for these ideas. They don't stand alone usually. Um, not that I think people can't understand them. I don't know how they experience them or understand them, so that's a mystery to me. So to get your reflection on this, and maybe others in this project who are not in the room with me and have not been already dancing at, before they hear the articulation of the term arriving energetically or something, or get the glyph. The glyphs and the ideas are, are meant to um, do a kind of shorthand for the experience of something and give language to it so we can wrestle with it and, and reflect and um, study our experience. So in that sense, it's research. Um, it's a tool. But this idea of prescriptive, descriptive that I talk about in the interview has really kind of stimulated and confounded me lately because when it first arrived, the underscore, from these years of, of teaching, as a kind of articulation and shorthand, um, it was sort of describing what had already been building for 20 years. And a lot of these glyphs and words are in my notebooks from the court. But it kind of simplifies it in a way. But then it becomes something you can talk about and do in the future, which is a different activity. Um, but I feel like, that for me, the most exciting placement for myself in the research of that is to be between descriptive and prescriptive. So I'm having a present experience based on other signals and other cues and they're happening presently and my intuitions relative to that and the intentions of that given session and many other factors. But collectively, we can use this as a way of um, talking about it um, and getting closer to what our experience is, which I don't know that one can ever know what somebody else's experience is, but this is part of that curiosity about uh, comparing notes. So for you guys to then interface with this is quite new for me in a 
way. Um, I love a lot of what you said, and um, I wanted to get the rest of that sentence about a stable platform for, do you remember what, what it was? A stable platform for um, wandering, avoiding, and exploring. Wandering, avoiding? Yeah, so, so you need. And exploring. Or engaging, because you need to wander, but now and again, you're gonna, you need to go around the rock, or you can get out of the point. You can't just wander in and then hope that you get out. You need to develop routines for, for moving back and forth. When you say need to, what? Well, or else you, just from an evolutionary perspective, then the, the insect sensor motor routine will fade. Right. Um, I, th I thought there was a, it's sort of a metaphor for watching contact improvisational dance and hearing the gym. You guys are wandering, you're discovering each other, you're engaging, you're interacting. Sometimes you're disengaging, sometimes somebody bumps you the wrong way, and the next time around you're engaging it the wrong way. Uh, but there's sort of this idea of the wandering exploration of the hand, or the wandering. Well, it's interesting, this is this related, but in terms of contact improvisation over now almost 40 years that it's been evolving, there are different ways that people engage with that. And um, I find that because so much material has been generated over these years for teaching, specific forms and techniques that people are actually not exactly losing, but I can feel myself trying to re-stimulate maybe what you're calling wandering or acting in a way that the other doesn't have the exact uh, matching vocabulary. It's not a technique. It's If there is a technique, it's a technique in being available to respond to something that you didn't haven't done before that you don't know what to do with. But it's easy to read that out and complicitly just do the stuff that the other one knows how to do and have a little dance. And it can be fun, but it doesn't seem to be the same activity. So Even though it looks similar, I think. So here we replace search with wander. Did I say search no, and no, wander? I'm saying that. I in see. this case, instead of thinking of the animals searching for things to adapt to, it's wandering and discovering. Right, it's being uh, confronted with situations that are unusual and causing you to stimulate you to adapt. Because that is a question, is somebody getting better at predicting what their partner wants and giving it to them, or anticipating what they think their partner wants and not giving it to them, as a challenge to be ready to respond to something that didn't affect. And I would say that that's true, at least in, in my practice of it. Um, where to go from here? I mean, we could stop yeah. there. I mean, there's so much. Yeah, we, we do have so much, and we have some people kind of logging in online, and Marlon wants to say something. Yeah, uh, just, uh, uh, well, very interesting. The, can you hear me? Okay. I just yes. wanted to just throw in one other thing mm -hmm. um, to Corinne, because there was something about the direction of movement and the horizontal and the vertical. Yeah. We'll respond to that, and the arrow went up for vertical. But so much of what I do has to do with going down and falling. And um, rather than the kind of balletic, everything is high, it's about getting higher and it gets about getting up. So much of what we're doing has to do with getting down and falling. And I think there probably is a, is a lot to study there as well. I think vaudeville even, or other kinds of, of dance that, that are predicated on kind of a slapstick falling as a mistake to, to stimulate humor or, or empathy or something. Um, I feel like a very early demonstration of contact improvisation that we did at a, a dance uh, conference in England. Um, and this, this uh, man who taught the pas de deux for the Royal Ballet came charging up to me afterwards, like red and sweating practically. He was just so um, affected. Now, I don't know that he personally has ever done the kind of thing that we did, or seen it at that point. This was a long time ago. This was early 80s. Um, but he just hugged me suddenly, and which seemed extremely uncharacteristic of the British, to be honest. But um, And I felt like, um, what was I saying about that? The falling, that, that somehow viscerally, he knew what we were doing. He maybe had never done it, but there's something human about a, this particular form 
that it maybe sits somewhere between the um, you know eating your sandwich and being on point in a theater or other kinds of more contemporary art. So I just wanted to just put the arrow pointing down to or think about falling as a direction of movement too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we in that particular study we did not compare whether the verticality was a fall or a jump. So there were both things in there. Okay. Yeah. And and the to select the stimuli, the students had to make an arrow where they think the movement is coming from and where the movement is going to. So there are two arrows, one is up and one is down. Okay. And then we choose only those pictures, images where the students agreed uh, to a certain degree on, on the direction. Okay. Um, but I, I need to think whether there were just jumps and falls in the verticality or uh, some, some sort of releases in there as well. Right, because the act of moving slightly off balance all the time, being a little yeah. bit out of control, yeah. I think stimulates a kind of something in the audience of a little bit of fear, but ultimately they can trust that it's, we're not going to really hurt ourselves or each other, but it's still somehow... Sorry, Marlon, I really interrupted you. But no, 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 that's, uh, that, that's perfect. I think perhaps this uh, comment it, it can help to create a through line between the three, because I see these three kinds of experience that you all are bringing and one that is, of course, for the discipline of philosophy. Uh, the other is kind of the research in neuroscience. But of course, the philosopher. One of the things that you're that that is brought here as epistemology is accepting cognition as an embodied process, and as embodied and grounded. And in grounded also implies distributed between different minds and embodied minds. So I think that that is something quite interesting there. And then Corinne uh, has a research that is practically is kind of inner inner mind or kind of internal, but at the same time it's an interaction with certain kind of uh, resonant process that is called the, the, the mirror neurons or 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 understood through neuroscientific uh, methodologies in, in, in happening in our brains. And, and then Nancy, through 40 years or 30 years of a lineage of investigation, has been doing a phenomenological praxis <laughs> with movement, coming to uh, something that I call very similar results of practically what we're talking about. With, so in a way, I just want to throw here the the, 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 this difference, but at the same time that perhaps that we are all talking about the, the same epistemology, meaning how relationships are built in minds, how always, any, even if we fall or we are up or if we have this kind of movement or any kind of movement, the processes are more or less the same in relationship with how we relate with other bodies. So, so I think that there is something there about the embodied, grounded, distributed, and, and, and that perhaps is something that is shared by the three, three kinds of approximations. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. What do you so think? <laughs> unless somebody wants to follow that up, um, yeah. and this is connected, I just want to, I'll make myself visible here. I, I can say something to it. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you say uh, that I follow it through your scientific methodologies, I think the the research I'm doing, and also one of the reasons I'm struggling uh, a lot with the research I'm doing, is because I because I put attention onto the sensory experiences of the research I'm doing, and not not trying to ignore that that part and my experience from the dance and the embodied knowledge. So, um, I don't know whether I said this clear. Yeah. Um, if, yeah, I could, I could do neuroscientific research easier by means of controlling better for the stimuli and having, I would have clear results. They might not be the results that, that represent best uh, real life. But but they would be clear and controlled. Uh, yeah. But I say 
kind of because I have the sensory experience in dance and I know that this is important and relevant or the visceral responses to what Nancy said as an example of the verticality. That, I mean, that was one of the main reasons in a study when we looked at the stimuli. I looked at the stimuli and said, yes, but the difference between the stimuli and the results we found in that study is not just jumps versus not jumps, it's a kind of direction of the movement. So for me, that is really important to, to look at the stimuli and uh, consider the sensory experiences you have as a researcher, but also the subject has as participants to take that into account, even if it's not the main experimental question. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, Karin, and it's a big um, uh, contribution you've made, just that the research that you did around live performance versus video and the and the and the responses people have neurologically to that and I think that is a, a an example of something informed by your own experience probably maybe just of watching in that case um, yeah and maybe I should add to that also to say that this was a big team of qualitative researchers involved as well and when I started on that project I, I was very uh, suspicious on, on how you can combine or whether you really should combine qualitative research with neuroscience. And it has influenced me a lot to work with. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I want to bring up some of the conversation that's going on in the chat on the side um, that Bill and Nancy can see, but I don't think Korean can, can see it. There's a big conversation going on between um, some of the members of dancetech.net about essentially that um, the experiential research going on uh, in the underscore and also a kind of a coupling with natural forces as part of that experiential um, awareness of gravity and other natural forces. So um, Corinne, can you, are you on the dancetech.net website? Can you see that chat? No, but I can go there. Or, or we can copy them in the, we can paste them, yeah. copy and paste them in the in the Google Hangout inside. Yeah, I'll just go around. While we're doing this, Corinne, can mm -hmm. you hear me? Um, I wondered uh, if you could talk a little bit about uh, the uh -huh. Watching Dance project yes. and whether the, were you part of that, the Kinesthetic Empathy Watching Dance project in uh, Manchester? Yes, so that the uh, studies I talked about um, with the visual experience of the spectator watching ballet dance Indian dance or acting life was one experiment um, from that project. I wondered if the if the if there was some friction between the phenomenological approach of dance researchers. Maybe I didn't wonder, but I knew in advance. But and 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 the methodology of studying this neuroscientifically. I mean, there was a lot. <laughs> there, there was a lot of friction, and more at the beginning, I would say, than at the end. Um, but at the end, what remained as a friction is really how you combine the different kind of data sets. Right, that's yeah. what I meant. Was kind of yeah. And for me, it's a bit a similar question to how, how I combine my practice in creating dance performance with my practice in science. And, and in both cases, I don't yet have a clear solution. Yeah. But um, this, I think it's maybe what I should step away from trying to do is to do it at the same time because the data sets are really different so you cannot compare how you say there's a things apple with pears <laughs> or something um, at the same time but that they they kind of build different uh, moments in time of the of the research process so for example the study on the direction in movements there I'm much more look even though it's quantitative data I asked subjects what they experience, so it was nothing uh, neurological or brain scanning. It was really just them saying between, I think it was one and ten, how strongly do you have a kinesthetic response amongst other questions, and where in the body you feel it, and then use this information afterward to create a design for an experiment, scientific. So yeah. Sounds like it was very productive to struggle with those ideas. Bill, yeah. we're having a hard time hearing you on the cast, so. It yeah. sounds like it was a productive struggle to struggle with those ideas. For me, it definitely was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
And Bill, um, someone's asked if you can repeat the question that you had asked Corinne before. Uh, so I, some some of the th some of the work that Corinne has done has to do with understanding how the phenomenological approach of dance research studies might interact with the more quantitative uh, methodology of neuroscience. And I wanted to know what the outcome of confronting this distinction among methodologies was, mm -hmm. and, and if she could speak a little about how it had helped as a productive force in her research. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and I think what is, what is really important for projects like that, um, but often not taken into account into the budget funding at the beginning or the time schedule at the beginning is that really the people from the different disciplines should be able to spend enough time in the research environment of the other disciplines. Right. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, if, if I might just say something too about that was where I started after hearing Corinne and hearing Bill and, and, and feeling this experience in my body, mind, of, uh, of the frequency of vibration of that kind of activity was so high. Realizing that built into the underscore, and in fact we talked about building this into every activity that happens in this Meta Academy project, at least this one pilot of it, since it's based on the underscore, that the, the arriving energetically and arriving physically, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And what is it, where does it take us to in terms of a level at which we do our research? Like, where are we coming from, so to speak? It doesn't matter. If you're doing quantitative research, maybe it's just you just need to be able to think clearly and evaluate. It doesn't matter whether you have a runny nose or if it's raining or anything about other conditions that do affect the human being and it affects the body mind and it affects how you dance and probably does affect how you interact with them and think. But you know, how do we study that? Like that that platform for beginning to have a conversation about something yeah. and and proceeding with the research. I just feel so different when I enter an improvisation, depending on how I prepare for it prepared my mind, my body, my senses, mm -hmm. my attitude, a number of things. It doesn't have to take a long time. Mm -hmm. But over and over, I feel like it's a huge difference. I don't know that it's better one way than another, but I do feel that it's very different. And I didn't want to impose my way. Rachel said, well, you know, do you want to do it before these talks today in the Google Hangout? That we would just take a moment to, in, in my terminology, arrive. And uh, I thought, no, you know, I just don't really want to have to set the context every time. I want to see what it's like if I don't. And, and how does that feel? Mm -hmm. um, but I just bring it up because it is a factor and we could do it next time or something like that and, mm -hmm. and see just even the tone of voice changes. Mm -hmm. When one actually engages experience of gravity and being here, Mm -hmm. And what is that? And breath. And just taking a moment to synchronize my intelligence, my mind, my, my mind, with my body, and just for a moment having them kind of be on the same page, mm -hmm. so to speak, and then yeah. seeing what happens next after that. Um, yeah. But anyway, that's all. Rachel, yeah. uh, would you like to read some of the? feedback or comments of, of the remote audience? Yeah, the, the audience is um, talking a lot about methodologies of research mm -hmm. and um, experience as a methodology of research, the artistic process as a method of research versus the scientific method. Um, somebody mentioned, I think it was Colleen Bartley, was talking about the you know the scientific method starting with a specific question and the um, point of improvisation as starting without um, a specific goal in mind. And so c comparing those two starting places, um, both as research practices, was, I'm sorry, I can't find it right now. And then there were some specific questions about contact improvisation, teaching, Nancy. Um, Kelly wanted to know, when you're working with people who are very experienced in the skills and looking for specific types of interactions, um, how do you teach them not to look for those types of interactions? And it would be interesting to hear from Bill and Corrine about 
the kind of mind uh, models for that. Uh, well, I was just uh, that sort of was stimulated a little bit by Corinne saying that you're struggling with something and the other frictions in the conference and that you're not really sure how to do this or that. And I, I just feel like that kind of uh, that kind of place, you could say, of, of researching is so um, positive to me and is so generative. Um, and how to instill that, it's really like rather than building up something, it's building it up and then taking it away. It's about deconstructing the, like, the vocabulary so that the spaces between things are more evident. Um, this could be just physically dancing with someone and continually interrupting those patterns. Um, mm -hmm. And going back to what to me seems uh, deeply elemental about the work, which is the physical forces and playing them in a way mm -hmm. that sort of challenges um, the vocabulary. The vocabulary seems, I, I don't know how this works scientifically at all, so please forgive my, my naivete, but there's a way of thinking about the vocabulary, of doing the right thing, where, what goes where, how to do this thing. Whereas I feel when I'm working on the level of the forces, it's more reflexive and a different kind of instinct is happening to save myself and to deal with the situation that so kicks in at that point. And so how to interrupt, but not replace, because I don't think there's anything wrong with certain patterns that have been established, they're there to be used too, but not if they get locked in in a way that doesn't make you better at being able to respond to what you don't expect. So I'm improvising that too in terms of how to interrupt those and how to not have an attitude either. Like it's better than the other way. Mm -hmm. But I just feel like if you're looking for a certain kind of game, like how do you find the game that you want to play? Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with people who love doing the rolling point of contact to the nth degree and go up on the shoulder and go around. And it's like a kind of ballet and virtuosity in itself, and it can be really fun. But it's a different, slightly different game. Where the level of improvisation, where the things that you don't know are, how big they are, or in what area you'll find them, could be just as thrilling for them. Because they don't know exactly how fast they're going to spin around, or if it's going to be three times or once before it changes. So they feel that they're improvising, and from and they are. But from another level, it's very patterned. And um, again, you choose your game. But some people don't know which games are available. So I feel like I often am champion, even though I'm teaching technique and vocabulary. I think it's useful in being able to have a little bit. Like you learn a few words so you can speak, you can begin to communicate something. It's important. But then also to leave some of that open so a new language can arise. Experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's another question I'd like to bring up. Does anyone want to respond to what Nancy just said before I go on? No, go on. I, I, would no. Ask, I would ask a question. Um, but maybe more on to head. Hello. Um, no, I think that that's, uh, we can go ahead with your question. Uh, so, so the question that, that I wanted to ask was, was when you're training people in contact improvisation. Um, you get closer to the mic. It, when you're training people, um, are you training them in contact points and ways to engage with each other so that when they interact with each other, it's safe and they right so that so that you know how to. If you're going to climb over someone's shoulder, you, there's a part of their body you're going to attend to. And when you're attending to it, you're attending to it with your whole body so that your weight is getting into their uh, kinesthetic space in a way that makes it safe for everyone to engage and enables you to engage gravity and attractive forces in the same way. And I, I, I would su suggest that in a way, this is a routine for learning to see in a contact improvisational way. That's flexible. That enables the flexibility and dynamics. That enables the wandering, right? So that you become sensitive to features of the environment that are that facilitate the wandering and the exploring, not the avoiding. Well, rather than address the actual technique of points of contact and stuff, because that isn't necessarily how I would teach it, 
but the but the forces involved that you're talking about mm -hmm. in negotiating physical things safely. Safety is a factor. We want it to be safe. We don't. It's a, there are different kinds of forms that are more into risk and, and don't mind injury, but we would like to keep our dancers' bodies going as long as possible. Um, so that is a factor. But I remember in the beginning of doing contact, and even now it, it happens, and we're going to engage with this, I think, in this project, of suddenly everything physical looks different to you. And you are playing with every movement that you can. What is it stable? Is it moving? If I hang off like this, or how do I come off this, or how do I support or it supports me? And you can it's sort of early parkour you would say yeah. in terms of playing on anything. Um, and so you do see things differently in that way. You can put yeah. on that lens. You can also take it off as most of the time you might need to in social situations. <laughs> well because actually I've noticed and I don't know if this is relevant to it, any of this is stuff, please stop me, but if I happen to go to a non, um, like to a disco or to a dance environment that isn't our environment, and I, my body goes below a certain latitude level, like if I go to the floor to roll or something, suddenly everybody is really aware of that. It's mm -hmm. almost like a danger to them and they're looking at me. Mm -hmm. Or if I invert or do a certain, if I'm this far off the axis, Nobody minds. But at a certain critical point, suddenly the alarm goes out, like something's wrong here. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I, I'm actually, I test that sometimes to see how far I can get without anybody paying attention to me and to have fun in an environment like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to, to, to point out an important factor, perhaps, that is the inclusion of training. Because we are also very interested in training, of course, as a way of transmitting, and uh, and uh, sometimes in tension, in in some tension with uh, certain notions of uh, universals of things that perhaps have embodied uh, our embodied cognition have uh, make us prone to, like what you just said, perhaps you know that when we tend to see a body in the low in the part of the room in a a kind of a horizontal position immediately trigger perhaps some kind of uh, innate response. But I think that in the tension between also the training, when the training is very important because then, uh, then also in neuroscience where we, we, it's been used also a lot or in, even in general culture or, or in popular culture perhaps, the, the idea of plasticity. So then perhaps our embodiment is in the is ongoing in this ongoing uh, space that is trained and modified by you know a lot of the styles that we study and also the even the architecture <laughs> you know like put put it in a this place so I just wanted to put the uh, a, a term there of plasticity in relationship with with a, a train or and uh, because also it's our possibility of having an agency in changing our ways of being in the world, <laughs> knowing that we are an embodied, uh, that, that there is an embodied co uh, condition. So anyway, so, so what I'm saying is that we, we may be talking about the specificities of, of some trainings, but it seems like what is behind is the possibility of change our environment <laughs> through training or through trainings you know uh, and and then perhaps even that impacts and this is for Corinne the our possibility of respond empathetically with the tr movements that we have been trained to so if we if we know more about certain kinds of movement then perhaps we may respond in a more empathetic way. I don't, I don't know. So anyway, I just want to put there the, the idea of, of training and uh, because it's not just movement, it's not just a reflection of this, it's actually with a lot of the condition of the history and the history of the interactions of, of the individual. Anyway. The quick just response to training is I feel like in this, at least in contact improvisation, in many cases it's about untraining. Mm -hmm. um, it's about trying to sort of again um, 
diffuse the resistance or the defenses against uh, gravity or against uh, like controlling the environment rather than working with the environment. Mm -hmm. So um, people are often quite amazed at how well their reflexes work if they're mm -hmm. not interrupting them with other kinds of instructions. Yeah. Um, but it's a dialogue between all of that. It's not yeah. just one or the other. And how to use the appropriate one at the appropriate moment depending on what you're doing. Yeah. So, Corinne, do you have any response to this part, or? <laughs> we'll put you in the spotlight. <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> well, in the while you're thinking, I think this will be um, these two discussions will be like the last ones. Mm -hmm. um, Sandra Mathern um, has asked in our chat. If Nancy could respond um, to Bill's um, framing of um, art about communicating or expressing, can Nancy respond to the notion put out by Bill that art is about communicating or expressing? <laughs> and maybe Bill wants to. Like, <laughs> uh, I I'm under fire. <laughs> well, when you said expressing, I thought, hmm. And I wrote down in my book before you said communicate about communicating. Because I think something is transmitted through any work of art, and probably other things, about the state of mind and of the artist, and thing that they interact with things. Whether it's didactic in the sense of, I need you to understand what I mean, um, and it's this. Or, I want, I'm inviting you to feel this or to be exposed to this state or this environment. Because actually, relevant to this whole project, I have been experimenting with doing public underscores, like modified public underscores. Modified in terms of time, because they're usually three hours uh, when we do them. And that's kind of a long time. But these durational things could happen. In what context would it be more of an installation? Do people come and go? How do they participate? Like the, the research on the level of inviting people in and getting their responses. People who may or may not have mostly not done this kind of thing. Those people are very, seem more moved than the people who could be out there doing it. Which was a kind of inverse of a little bit of what you're saying, Karen, which I found interesting. That they had never maybe consciously experienced an environment like they were being exposed to by being in the room with people interacting like this with their own bodies, with each other. Um, we did a public tour in central Turkey um, at the end of this project, which I doubted that anybody was going to have any resonance, relevance. What could this possibly seem to them closer? Yeah. Um, but we did it, and we created, we put big pieces of paper out with the underscore glyphs and words and translations in Turkish, just as a way to say, there is something going on here. We present it to you. We don't expect you to understand it. And, and if the French, the, the European tourists who happen to be around seemed less interested. This is very crude research, of course. But there were a lot of people from the village there, a small village, that practically camped out next to the underscore, stayed for the whole thing, and were practically weeping in the, in the harvest circle at the end to try to communicate what they had experienced, which I was so moved by the foreman of the, the Turkish crew that built the floor that we were on, who was in caves in these little mountains next to where the floor was, watching a lot during the day, and then started to try it. And, the, and they use the term freedom a lot, which I take with a huge grain of salt. But just, again, wondering, what could this give people who are not in it doing it, in terms of a performance environment? Uh, do they pay? Do they sit? Can they move? Should they be in the, should they be escorted into the, the space with us? to actually experience in the inside of the signaling environment, rather than as a kind of TV on the edge, even if it's around the edge. But if they're brought in for five minutes, how does that feel? And, and the secretaries at this university where we were showing us had never even been in the theater before this moment. 
they worked there for 30 years. But they were ho housing some of the artists, the dancers. So they thought, sure, I'll come and see what you were doing. So they had a human connection already with some of the people, which I think is significant. And they just felt so relaxed and present. And, and I thought, hmm, what's going on here? So transmission of some kind, mm -hmm. I think, is happening in performance. I, I don't know. Yeah. Right. So, so if we think of communication like expressing sentences, so that if you don't explicitly understand my intention, you don't understand my sentence, that's not what we mean by artworks being communicative events or communicative strategies. Uh, they could be that. I mean, I think that Duchamp probably wanted us to know something and then pretended he didn't believe that that's what he said. Or something. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, just painting a beautiful sunset conveys the content of the aesthetic. It, it presents an aesthetic experience to someone or an aesthetic object, and it expresses ideas about what you think the aesthetic is by choosing to paint it in that way. The, the story that, that's embedded in that slide that would take longer to say is that there, when you think about producing an artwork, there isn't an ideal way of producing an artwork. You always have to make a choice about how you've made your mark. And making that choice, it, it expresses some minded intentionality, and in doing that is expressive of some content, of some sort of thought or choice that, that, that you have. And so content doesn't mean meaning in a deeply semantic way. It just means content. Some work has more abstract content. I, I don't think that ever in our lives we fail to be expressing something in our bodies, even if it is I'm not paying any attention to it. You know, our bodies are always expressing. So, so just to qualify, you, you know, analytic philosophers are notoriously interesting. Yeah. And I, I run the risk of being bad. I, I thought the uh, examples that Nancy was describing were hugely interesting for me and is very, very closely related to some of the questions we ask ourselves with research and of how involved are the people that we study and what is the difference in how, how involved they are. Interesting. Thank you. How do you ask yourselves those questions? Well, I feel that, that for the research I'm doing, this, this is one of the points that came out either directly or indirectly as being relevant for the responses we get. So it's not just about physical expertise or visual expertise, but for example, in the, in the study where I found that actually experienced ballet spectators so strong or more to resonance with ballet. We did not find what we hoped we would find the same for the Indian spectators as well, and the question was always why. And I believe it had to do not only with the amount of visual experience of the spectators, which was more varied than for the ballet spectators, but also with the, the specific differences in the cultural background and the social status background of the spectators in relationship to the performer on how well they really could connect with the performer because they were coming from the similar environment or not. So we had much more variation in there than in the ballet. And I think that's one of the reasons why the effect wasn't so clear. For the Indian spectators. So then, for our next experiment, you, you would then ask yourself exactly the questions that Nancy stated and phrased herself very nicely. You, you would then look into what is really the difference if you ask people to join and be in the circle and experience it directly, or what what is the difference then to compare to when they sit at the outside and, and look passively, or whether they are friends that kind of come and see what you have been doing the whole week, or foreigners, or not foreigners, but kind of people who don't know, are not family related or friend related to the performance. And also, yeah. what's the effect of the change of condition on the dancers? If yes. If you're doing a private underscore, what's the difference in your approach, in your expectations, in, in choices right. that you would make in a public underscore versus a private underscore, and and again in the shades of gray there, so it's not like we are showing the underscore, we are presenting, I'm going to do my best moves, I'm not going to make any mistakes, but all of that is part of the exploration and the underscore, so how do you 
perform the unperformable, or the, you know, how do you act natural? <laughs> so it, it brings up a lot of interesting issues like that on a very fine-tuned level of how to set up the structure and the intention, and you look at the, are they part of this, you know, many questions that are, are quite engaging for us now. And I think that both areas, the, that research into performance of the underscore and the private research of the phenomena of things and how to articulate them and how to play with them are, for me, both equally as interesting but, but, but significantly different. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, other, let me just go here. Yeah, we have other very interesting uh, comments from our remote audience. It's like one is like, how can somatic experiences be measured? Are they important to other scientists or just too out there? Uh, the body mind to me is such a rich d data, but I don't know uh, how my inner state can be described accurately enough for a scientific in inquiry that is traditional. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think that, of course, there's something that I can see, of course, with the uh, questions and comments is that there is a lot of uh, uh, curiosity and, 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 and to go deeper in try to understand when we talk about somatics, what is somatics? When we talk about experience, how can we then articulate a common ground to get into this conundrums, you know, or, or, or to understand, you know, experience, <laughs> expression, communication. And uh, so I think uh, there, there are other words that have been added, witnessing, for example. And of course, I think what is bringing a lot of interesting noise and tension is the notion of research in itself. Uh, as this extreme of uh, experiential practice, practice of phenomenological practice with movement, with an intention of exploration and change, and at the, or training, <laughs> and at the same time, the methodologies uh, or research methodologies or third person methodologies to leave data. So, but I think is the richness is all here in relationship to something that I will, I just want to bring just this last topic about the notion of ref, the reflexes, you know, and in a lot of the Steve's writings and, and the, the things that for example, Nancy, Nancy was talking today, it feels like the training is to work in contact improvisation, and this was an interesting movement of the focus, the trainings in the reflexes instead of in the volitional act of dancing in certain shape. So that brings for me what I think is a reverse architecture or a training in a bottom-up architecture that happen to be a lot of the paradigms that we know now in neuroscience. So, so I just want to bring back that that is very important for us that in Meet Academy we are placed in the lineage of contact improvisation <laughs> because we are not just talking about mirror neurons or the reflex of the pathetic uh, relationship. In perhaps in this kind of training is reflecting in itself a focus on uh, an architecture architecturally in a different way, that we practically are putting ourselves on purpose to be trained in other reflexes, to react. And that is a different kind of control that in dance was perhaps in the kind of Western dance, it's very different. So, so I just, uh, it calls my attention that idea of reflexes, because we're not training just the muscles to make a specific shapes or construct certain kind of uh, very modernist way of thinking, but it's kind of a much more dynamic. It's, it implied uh, the dynamics of a different kind of system. Yeah. Yes, if I might. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. That, that we haven't mentioned the word improvisation very much. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> and, uh, we're improvising. And that's why the sort of body-mind relationship and the relational thing, we're not just executing, no, no, we're negotiating. So it's a collaborative negotiation that is embodied, and you're getting feedback all the time, and you're modifying, and it depends on many things, and there are a lot of things to study about that. But I think that that is a very significant difference 
um, in a lot of the other behaviors that we're talking about that are that are embodied in terms of yeah. embodied behavior. Yes. So, um, well, uh, I, we can say, do you have any other kind of final uh, comments? And uh, also, Rachel, if you see something else that I don't see here that we can bring in also. What do you think? How are we for the future? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. yes. I just want to thank Nancy and Bill and Corrine for a really exciting conversation. And, and our um, remote and audience. Our, yeah, our remote audience. And who have been extremely patient. Yes, thank you. We will get it together next week. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why. But... The video chat. So um, is, is the idea that this also becomes sort of fuel for some yeah. follow-up with the um, academy people in different ways technologically that you're going to lead them through somehow? Well, these actually, these are resources that um, the Meta Academy um, lab participants are free to kind of remix and comment on, tag, and do a bunch of the kind of digital um, excavating that we're training, for, <laughs> training them to do um, through the course of the lab, but it's also each of these could be its own meta academy. <laughs> own resource, its own resource in itself. You know, what, one of the things that is interesting about network architectures is that they're also uh, collaborative and it has, it has a fundamental infrastructure that is very similar to perhaps things in the underscore that, that they can be uh, uh, remanage, reassess, renegotiated, and we that's what we want to happen, that this is an ongoing uh, collaborative creation of, of knowledge in relationship with the body. And there will be many different opinions, you know, and I think that that's, that's the point. Um, so, and Kari, uh -huh. I the last image, I guess, which was going to be the first image of, speaking of improvisation, yeah. and friction, and positive friction um, to feel how you guys are improvising and winging this whole thing moment to moment and creating it and wanting to be spontaneous but also having to plan in advance to make any of this happen and the friction to the tension between those impulses is very creative and, and yeah. illuminating and I appreciate it. Yeah. I just want to point out that someone in the chat, Natalie Heller, said, would love to see academics, philosophers, and neuroscience experience body work, <laughs> somatic work. Will we get a chance for that? <laughs> <laughs> I will and, broadcast. And, and I wanted to actually add that the suggestion of Nancy to have an experience, underscore experience at the beginning was something I th was thinking about, about online interactions. I think that's a really nice idea. I would love to participate. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, time, you know, the difference between what I call body time and, and clock time and digital time and internet time of attention spans and necessities and wondering how quickly one could um, arrive. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it doesn't have to take long. Maybe it's really just trying to figure out a way to propose a kind of platform when you speak of, or an entry point for the discussions and other things that are happening. So thank you for reiterating that and, and, and supporting it, because we'll try to figure out something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. There's someone on the chat that wants to do some movement practice and send it, but I don't know that we're going to have time for that today, although that would be a wonderful um, contribution to our... Yeah, I mean, this is sort of ongoing. This is going to end with, like, the project is ongoing, and, and we're going to make ways for people to feed in these things. Ah, it's moving! <laughs> Paul? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Well? Well, thank you. Thank you. Rachel, could you put yourself in the camera just to take a screenshot of you? <laughs> Rachel. Take it away, Rachel. Uh, Rachel. Yes, I'm trying to select this. Yes, I'm taking a screenshot, posting. <laughs> thank you very much.
<laughs> it's amazing. I, I'm sorry that I was the disembodied voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so well, thank you very much to everybody and Corinne, Nancy, and Bill, and to the 18 people that we have waiting and trying to figure out what's going on. We sent invitations, we follow all the protocols, and I don't know what happened. So, but we will try to figure this out for the next session. This is uh, being uh, recorded and it will be posted in on uh, dastek.net in the group of uh, uh, Minded Motion. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we are ending the. So say goodbye. Bye bye. bye. <laughs> cool. So I am ending the broadcast.